Thank you for being here. Happy Memorial Day uh, with gratitude for those who have laid their lives down in the history of our country. And I uh, hope you have an amazing Memorial Day weekend. Or if you skip church to be camping or something, you're watching this or listening to this down the road, we're glad you're here as well. Thank you for listening to this, giving us some time. Really glad. Hope you had an amazing Memorial Day. Uh, we are in a season that we've called the River Wild, the River Wild. We're getting in that raft with Merrill Streep, and we're, we're kicking Kevin Bacon to the curb, and we are discovering the power of the gauntlet. We're discovering how the surging, racing uh, floodwaters of a, of a river in the midst of rapid season is like the grand adventure of following Jesus. And we're in John chapter 7 this week as we come to the, the last message in this series uh, with the actual text that originally inspired this series. Though we saved it for the end, it was the, the passage of scripture that, that God originally just grabbed me uh, with and had me just focus us on rivers all this spring. It's been amazing, hasn't it? We do invite you back next week. I'm going to be kicking off a three-part message series. It's going to be one message broken down into three weeks that I'm calling The Secret to a Good Life. The Secret to a Good Life. I hope you'll come back. I hope you'll tune in, because this is going to be good. And uh, I can't wait to preach it next week, or over the next three weeks, actually. And in the midst of that, we'll be Rock the City in, at the, at, at the the climactic end of it will be Father's Day. We're going to honor the fathers of the Fresh Life House. It's going to be a word for all of us. But the secret to a good life starts next week. We hope you'll join us. John chapter 7, we're jumping in and verse 37. I have preached this passage, I can't even, I can't even recall, maybe six times in my life. Uh, but God has shown me so many new things. I feel like I had never read it before when I began studying it. This, this most recent time, it says in verse 37, on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. I have always prided myself on being the kind of person who has a pocket knife on him at the appropriate moment that one is needed. I just like that. I, in my mind, see myself as the kind of person in a situation where, like, even if it's not super needed, it's not drastically needed, it's not a child's toy that you need you know, a chainsaw to get out. What is it with these toys these days, the packaging these days? But even if it's just like a, a slightly you know, necessary situation, like, oh, there's this package. And someone's like, oh, and I'm like, oh, do, do you need it? Like, I, I, in my mind, I see myself as the person in a situation who has a pocket knife and is ready to serve, you know, ready to do my, my duty. I, just, I, I see myself that way in my mind. So I love having, I, I hate nothing more than being in a situation. And I reach, and I don't have a knife on me, don't have a tool on me. And when, like, I, I just feel so helpless. I feel so useless. And it's pretty much, you want to guarantee you won't need a pocket knife, put a pocket knife in your pocket that day. But the day that you don't have one with you, there's going to come a need. And you're going to just look for it and feel for it. It's not there. And, uh, but there does come at some downsides, right? Especially if you travel through airports ever. I have anybody ever tried to get a knife onto an airplane? Yeah, that's a terrible feeling. Uh, one time I had, this, I had this, this Leatherman in my pocket at the airport. And I, I realized it's there just before I go in, which is lucky because once you go in, you're not getting that sucker back. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, and so I realized I, I can't mail it to myself. I don't have any, any way to go check it into a bag. And so I thought, I, just, I, just, this, I, didn't, I need this knife to have a good home. You know, I got into adoption real quick on that moment. And so I left security, and I go wonder. I got to find the right owner. And I see this guy who's waiting at the, the exit towards baggage claim, presumably to pick up a family member who had been on a journey. And I, I, I studied everybody there for a while before figuring who was the worthy parent for my pocket knife. And I see this guy. He looked like you know he worked. He worked with his hands. You could tell he had some calluses. He he um, 
He, I, if I had to guess, I would say from Mexico or South America, uh, where his family's descended from. And, and so I approached him. I said, hey, man. And he immediately said, you know, he didn't speak English. And I said, OK, that's OK. I just want to give you something. And so I tried through body language to say, I got to fly, but I have this knife. And I, I don't know how, what was getting across, but it ended with me with both hands taking this pocket knife out and saying, will you take this knife? and love it all its days. Will you honor it? Will you cherish it? <laughs> Forsaking all of the knives you may have owned, will you live only under this knife as long as you both shall live? And I think he eventually he sort of connected what, he was, what I was asking of him, and, or, or he just wanted me to go my, my merry little way. And so he, he, said, he said, gracias. He said, thank you. And I walked off, and I watched him with great satisfaction put the knife into his pocket. And I just imagined, like, four generations from now, this knife being handed down <laughs> and it being, like, lore in his household the day the gringo in the aeropuerto um, <laughs> gave me this knife, and this is now a part of storied generations within his lineage and dynasty, or at least that's how I imagine it. But what I love about this particular knife is that it has a bottle opener on it. And that's one of the funnest things. Like, I love explaining this. Lennox loves to say, Dad, tell me all about your knife, and I'll tell him all the different things to you. It's amazing having a three-year-old around, because he's so easily impressed. I want him to stay as easily impressed as he is right now, because literally, uh, last time he asked me about it, he said, tell me about this. I said, it's got screwdrivers, got pliers. He goes, it has scissors, too? I go, it has scissors, too. He goes, and a sharp thing? I said, a sharp thing, a screwdriver. He goes, Dad, that is a lot of tools. I was like, I know, I know, I know, son. I am very, I am very uh, happy with how impressed you are. Uh, but, but I do love, I love the ability that it has when, when needed, just to be like, hey, you know what? Uh, you, need, you need that bottle open? Well, guess what? I am here to serve. Are you thirsty? I ha well, here. Mm. Delightful. And, uh, and, and it does occasionally backfire, though, because this, of course, being a, uh, a pry-off bottle cap, or crown, as they originally were called. Uh, I, I remember one time I was with a gal who had, had a, a, a sort of look just like it. And, and she had you know, freshly manicured nails. And so as she went to do it, I was like, oh, let me, let me do that for you. So I grabbed my knife out. And she goes, no, 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 you don't need it. And I go, no, no, I, I got this. I do this all the time. And I, am, I, I tell you, I'm just, and she goes, no, I, I, I don't need it. And I, I'm like, yes, I will. And I, I'm going for it forever. And then she finally says, that's actually a twist off cap. And I was like, oh, <laughs> solid point. Uh, so it wasn't my finest hour. I will completely admit that to you today. But that's exactly, if you could believe it or not, what is happening here that has caused Jesus to stand up and cry out. I don't know if you noticed it, but it says here at this feast, and we'll explain what's going on, that Jesus stood up and cried out. Like the gal with the manicured fingers who's like, no, you don't understand. There's an easier way. You're struggling here with this tool you think that is so powerful, but, but all you need is your hands. Everything you need to get it off is right there in front of you. The text says, on the last day, the greatest day of the feast. Now, when you read the Old Testament, one thing becomes abundantly clear. God likes to throw a party. It's amazing. Uh, my dad likes to say that in the whole Old Testament, there's only one mandatory fast, but there are mandatory feasts every page turn you basically you, you turn. There's, if you want to like, go, whether God's a killjoy or, or, or somebody who's a great joy to be around, you, you, you immediately just look to God's schedule, and you see party, 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 party. Oh, here's this day to be fasting and to, be, to have like, a, a heart that's more you know, turned in of, 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 of considering sadness and being more circumspect. But the rest of it, like he is just constantly hiring a caterer, getting the disco ball out. He's got a special case that it goes in, because it comes out and comes, goes back in so often. He's like, well, that's where the disco ball stays. And, and he's just, there's parties everywhere. There were three great feasts, Passover and Pentecost. And uh, you have, of course, this that we're talking about here, the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Tabernacles. And on the Feast of Tabernacles, basically, everybody sort of camped out. And on this day, uh, they would build these little tents in their yards or wherever they could find open space. 
And it was, again, one of the three feasts that you would travel to Jerusalem for if you lived in some other part of Israel. And it was a very exciting time. And there were special songs. Like, it was like God even gave them like the road mix, you know, road trip playlist mix. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is the music we listen to whenever we're, we're traveling to Jerusalem. It's kind of like those, those songs that you don't, you don't enjoy, but you, like, you'll enjoy them on a road trip. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just the, the, we have the, the, the lowest standards for music when we're in a 19-hour drive. Like, anything. It's like anything to give ourselves. You know, I love the Beach Boys. Like all of a sudden, like who loves the Beach? Well, I love a Beach Boy playlist on a road trip. I'll tell you what. You gotta, you gotta. There's what you can do and what you you will do in order to survive, right? And 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 so God gave them these psalms of ascent. That there were songs they were always singing to themselves to pass the time with their families. They were traveling up to Jerusalem, always up to Jerusalem. And so they would travel, and they would sing, and they would talk, and then they would get there, and they would assemble the materials needed to build these tents. And you would, you would camp out. You wouldn't live in your regular house. You would, live in, you would live in this booth. And so the nickname for this festival, the Feast of Tabernacles, became the Feast of Booths, because you would live in this tent. It was technically a seven-day holiday, but God gave them eight days to observe it which tells you something about how smart God is. How many of you all know you need a day of vacation to catch up from your vacation? Anybody with me on that? Like, it is so smart not to schedule your trip ending, and then the next day you're going to be back at work. How about a day to clean the camping gear off? How about a day just to re, you know, orient yourselves with life, right? So God said, it's a seven-day feast, but I want you to take eight days every time you do it, because that eighth day is going to be you know, to tearing down the booze, to putting stuff away. To, to, to sort of reacclimating your heart to what is needed to, to get ready before you jump right back into your day-to-day life. And the, the, the high point of the feast was, of course, the remembering of the water. The feast was all about water. Because during the wilderness wandering, during the time where they lived in the desert, their forefathers, before they got to come into the promised land. They had to wander around. We preached about it in the series. They had to wander around in the wilderness. It wasn't originally supposed to be that way, but because of their hard-heartedness, they were going to stay in the wilderness till the entire generation fell away, and only their children, who they accused God of not caring about, were going to get in. And during that time, they would have died, because in a desert, y'all, you die if you don't have water. 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 And God miraculously, supernaturally, providentially supplied their need with water, get this, that came out of a rock. A river opened up. God opened up a river that poured out of a boulder. And this feast, of course, it was all about the wanderings. It was all about God taking care of them, leading them by fire at night and cloud by day. But at the center of it was, you met our greatest need. And you still will, we believe. Water. It's really cool how they did it. They're all camped out, right? And then they would all assemble. And the population of Jerusalem would swell up to up to 2 million people during the Feast of Tabernacles. So a lot of people everywhere. And they would all sort of try and get down to the temple or, or where they could see the temple or get a vantage point of the temple. And, and what would happen is the high priest had this golden pail, a golden bucket. And he would fill it up with water from the pool of Siloam. And then he would, he would travel with that golden pail all the way to the temple. And as they traveled, they would recite Psalm, Isaiah 12, 12, verse 3, which says, therefore, with joy, you will draw water, water that comes from the wells of salvation. They would, they would quote from uh, the Psalms. Which, which cry, which, 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 which read, save now, Lord, save us now, Psalm 118, verse 25. Oh, Lord, I pray you would now send us all your prosperity. And there was this big ritual of, of the, the golden pail of water traveling to the temple where it would be poured out as they would remember. And that would happen for six days. But on the seventh day, that great day of the feast, which tells you how popular this holiday was. They didn't even call it a feast. They called it the feast. This is the people's choice, OK? This is the one they love. This is, this is in, in elf parlance, the show, right? All the other elf jobs, not the deal, right? Christmas is the show, right? That's what this feast was to the people. And as they would, on this day, show up, the, 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 the priest would have two golden pails. And it would be twice as much water they would gather. And then when they got to the temple, he wouldn't just pour it out. He first would do what's called a Jericho lap. And Jericho lap, of course, is seven laps. And this spoke of 
Of course, the, the, the fact that once they got into the promised land, God continued to provide for them by tearing down the biggest barrier to their being inside the promised land. That was the city of Jericho. And then as that water would all be poured out, that was like the ultimate moment. Everyone would cheer. That was the kickoff of the great party. Everybody was just losing their mind. And at that moment, on that day, the great day, J. Vernon McGee says, as Jesus spoke these words, it would, have, it would have been as though water was splashing up to his ankles. Jesus stood up, which was not how leaders, religious leaders in that day spoke. They always sat, and everybody else stood. But Jesus, who was sitting, stood up and cried out. Something made him raise his voice. What was he saying? He was saying, it's a twist off, not something you got to pry off. Because he realized in that moment, these people were looking to something to meet a need that couldn't help but disappoint them. They were looking to religion to hydrate them. They were looking to ritual to hydrate them. They were looking to their identity as Jewish people to hydrate them. They were looking to this priest to hydrate them. They were, they were hoping in the, the, the past and what their forefathers' relationship with God looked like. He realized they were missing it. And so he cried out, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And if you do, rivers of living water will come pouring from your innermost being, gushing out into the world. You're hoping that this religious experience will meet a thirst inside of you. And that's not the only thing we look to. There's so many different things that we hope will satisfy us, every single one of us has many things in this world that we've identified. If I could do that, have that, be that, wear that, know him, sleep with her, if I could just rethink that's what's going to satisfy. But Jesus knew that they would, the moment they put these, these booths away into storage, they would still be empty, still be deficient. It, it made them feel good for a moment. They got a buzz from this experience for a moment, but he knew it wasn't enough. It's the same thing he told a woman who had been married and divorced five times because she, she was so convinced that the next guy was the guy who was going to complete her and meet the deficiency that, that, that she felt was inside of her. And that's why he told her in John 4, 14, whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst. But indeed, the water I give him will become what? A spring of water welling up to eternal life. He's saying, honey, you think this guy's going to meet your need. This guy's going to make you not thirsty anymore. But the only thing you're going to find is more thirst. You're going to get thirsty again. And that's how all water in this world is. And Jesus here is saying, religion too. Religion too. Church can't meet your need. These things can't satisfy you. Ritual can't satisfy you. Owning a Bible can't. Seeing yourself as, as the kind of person who loves God can't define you. Only a relationship with me. Jesus said, come to me and drink. Come to me, and I will quench your thirst. And here's the beautiful thing. He said, if you do that, something's going to flow out from you. Not only are you not going to be thirsty again, but you're going to find that the drink that you receive leads to a river that flows out of you the drink that becomes a river. He's saying, if you take my life into you, something dynamic and powerful is going to flow out of you. A drink comes in, a river comes out. That has always been God's promise. That has always been what God has offered to people who will look to him and, and have faith to receive it from him. It's in Isaiah 58, 11. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land. He will strengthen your, your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Zechariah adds that this flowing of water will be able to happen both in the summer and the winter. He's saying it won't be contingent upon whether it's a dry season or a rainy season, because this water is supernatural. It's from heaven. He's saying you can flourish and thrive even in the midst of difficulties in life. 
He's saying there's a river wild life that God has for you, intends for your relationship with him to be like, not just church as usual, just business as usual. Oh, just another weekend, working for it, looking forward to it, but disappointed by it ultimately. He's saying your life walking with him can be this grand adventure, like a, like a, like a pulsating river, like a pounding current, like the way your heart races when you hear it thundering, like the, like the idea of a waterfall. I'm telling you, it can be lush. It can be tropical. It can be dynamic. Your life with Jesus, following him, walking with him, it can be like a, like a raging river. It taps into something inside of you. A river is so visceral. It's peaceful. When you're around it, you sense it. You see it. You smell it. You feel it. There's more oxygen in the air being churned up. There's just something about it. And so Jesus said, that is what it's like to do life with me. Because when you let me come in you, I will send my Holy Spirit flooding out from you, out into this world. So no longer are you looking to the things of the world to satisfy you or fill some emptiness inside of you. But that's all already done. That's long since been taken care of. And now you walk into this world not needing the world to do something for you, but you will have something to offer this world. You'll walk into situations where you otherwise would have been asking, how do I stack up? How do I measure up? Now you're walking in so that a river of life can flood out of you into that person, into that dry ground, into that hard place. I'm telling you, God wants to not just meet needs inside of you. God wants to open up a well of living water, springs in the desert that are going to flow out of you into dry places. And everywhere you go, and everyone you touch, and every experience you're in, it's going to be better. It's almost like there's just this river flowing. People aren't even going to know. They're just sensing what is happening here, being around you. And I want to show you four different ways the Holy Spirit wants to work his life, his river wild life in you. The first is that you're going to become more curious. As you walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, as you give in to the Spirit's leading and his guiding and his tugging, like I said, sometimes you're going to feel like, oh, I missed it. I put my foot down in the wrong shoe. And you're going you're gonna to take a couple spe- steps back and, and, and wonder, wh- wh- where did you want me to go that I missed it? You're going to, at times, sense that. And as you follow those promptings, remember, it's a still, small voice. It's not some big, loud, overt thing we're looking for. Words in a billboard, the clouds giving us pictures. It's just that sense of his peace. It's being still with him long enough to know his voice. And as you, as you do that, as he works through your pleasures, as he works through your desires, random things, little things, well, I'd love to do this one day. Hold on to that dream. Believe for that dream. In God's due time, it will come to pass. As that happens, here's what I want you to watch for. Notice that there's going to be a greater curiosity in you. I really believe one of the greatest unsung assets and benefits of doing life filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit of God, only possible through a relationship with God's Son, Jesus Christ, is that you will become a more curious person. Just a more curious. It's amazing how powerful curiosity is. I was, in fact, listening to this week an interview with Walter Isaacson. Walter Isaacson is an author who is amazing. He generally writes biographies, but he wrote a bio- some definitive biographies on Leonardo da Vinci, Albert Einstein, and Benjamin Franklin. That's, that made no good for a life's work. And I originally had read the biography he had written on Steve Jobs, which was amazing. He was given access to Steve at the very end of his life, and very powerful book. And so I made it my goal this year of my life to read every book other than that one that, that Isaac since written, and my family got them for my birthday, and I'm so excited about it. Uh, but, but I was listening to this interview with him just to kind of get to know him as a person. And he was asked, he said, you know, you wrote Benjamin Franklin and, 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 and Leonardo da Vinci and Albert Einstein's biographies. Was there any similarities between these three? And he said, it's funny that you should ask. There's one thing that I found combing through letters, combing through journal, combing through historical documents that really knits them all together. And he said they were all very curious people. They were extremely curious people. He went on to say the pattern wasn't that they were smart people, because you know, you and I have met lots of smart people, and they don't usually amount to much. <laughs> Brutal. The pattern, he said, tends to be curiosity across disciplines. And he expounded passionate, playful, and occasionally obsessive curiosity. Take Franklin, he said. Why did he fly a kite with a key on it? He's just curious. What's going to happen? (laughs) How could this possibly go wrong, right? How did he discover the the, the Gulf Stream and and bifold? He was curious. I don't know. He's always tinkering, always, always looking, like Bill Gates, willing to be confused. 
Da Vinci. When you read Da Vinci's uh, journals, you will find funny things at the top of his to-do list. Like one day he wrote, want to figure out why a woodpecker's tongue is so long. He's curious. He's got stuff to do. Paintings, I presume, waiting to be done, right? And, and yet, when he wakes up in the morning, Da Vinci, his to-do list is today, I'm going to, what are you going to do today? I'm going to figure out why a woodpecker's tongue is so long. Turns out he was onto something because a woodpecker's tongue is four times the length of its beak. And many people for a long time were wondering, how does a woodpecker not bash its brain in every time it peckers, pecks? <laughs> they say that if you were to smash your head into a, a, a tree at the same speed a woodpecker does, it's 10 times the amount of strength uh, uh, that your brain could withstand. You would be dead 10 times over if you head butted a tree like a woodpecker does. But apparently, scientists have figured out that every time it goes to do its pecking thing, that its tongue actually wraps around its brain and forms an airbag protecting its brain from what's happening there in the moment. So Da Vinci was on to something going, I need to figure out. He was on to something. He didn't, I don't know if he ever figured that out in his lifetime, but he was curious about the woodpecker. Albert Einstein actually doesn't, we don't have to wonder about it because he actually wrote, I don't have any special talents, but I still have my childlike curiosity, which is why I wonder what it would be like to ride alongside a light beam, why I wonder how gravity makes things move. Smartest person in the world? Not so much, just endlessly curious. I bring this up because we know Jesus was curious. How do we know that? Well, he asked a lot of questions. Did you know that Jesus was asked 183 questions? If you come through the New Testament, 183 times people asked Jesus questions. Do you know how many of those questions he answered? Three of them. Almost every other time you ask Jesus a question, do you know what his response was? They call it the Socratic method. Really, it's just what would Jesus do? It's he would respond with a question. In all, if you add up the questions that Jesus asked, you will come up with 307 questions. Every situation, everywhere he went, Jesus was curious. He was, he was asking. He was, of course, he wasn't asking to know. He, know. he knew everything. He was asking to help us understand. He was trying to provoke a greater curiosity. I believe when the Spirit of God is inside of you, hovering over the waters, as it were, like in Genesis, you're going to notice there's curiosity. You're asking questions about God, questions about other people. And here's one I want to throw at you. You'll be better at asking questions of yourself. When you're really triggered, when you're in a foul mood, instead of just going with it, you'll stop and ask yourself, why do I feel like this today? What's going on here? Why will you do that? Rivers have currents. And do you know what informs currents? Things happening beneath the surface. To understand a river, to understand its movement, you got to look at what's happening, but deduce what's happening down below. Is there a shelf that's dropping off? Is there structure here? Is there a rock here? That's what makes rivers dangerous, and that's what makes humans unpredictable. Not what we're seeing above, not what's going on, but what's happening down below. What is this touching? What wound is this tapping into? What is this bringing up? What happened before? When you watch people act bad, when you watch people frustrated, you have to almost get curious. And I wonder what's causing this. What would cause such a strong reaction? What's happening below the water? And the Holy Spirit's going to help you to be better at, at being curious with yourself instead of just lashing out when you're frustrated, but to stop for a second and ask yourself some questions, to stop in a moment and ask, why would someone respond so strongly? What's happening here? And we're going to be curious enough to go back to God every single day going, I need to know who you are. You need to show me something fresh. I'm not satisfied with the level I've received. I want to know you more. I want to know you better. I want to experience you. I want everything that Jesus has for me. I'm telling you that you can tell when the Spirit of God is involved in your life when you're curious. Secondly, when you're content, when you're content, content with who he made you to be, content with where you're at in life, you will know the Spirit of God is moving through you and in you and out of you like a river wild when you look at your life and you say, you've done all things well. My cup runs over. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. And the Spirit needs to help us do that because by nature, we are so often 
insecure. By nature, we are so often jealous. By, by nature, we so often don't appreciate what's in our hands because we are so busy staring at what's in someone else's. Did they get something better than me? Did you get my blessing? Did you get my promotion? That was supposed to be my opportunity. But it takes the secret. And only the secret things of God belong to God. So only the Spirit of God can help us tap into the secret things. And Paul said, I have discovered the secret of being content. How does the Spirit do that? We learn of him. How, Philippians 4, 11, to be content, whatever my circumstances are, just as happy with as little as he gives us as if he gives us much, just as happy with as much as with little. He said, I found the recipe, the recipe for being happy, whether I'm full or whether I'm hungry, whether my hands are full or my hands are empty. Here's the secret. Are you ready? The Spirit is going to teach you this. Whatever I have, wherever I am, I can make it through anything in the one who makes me who I am. I'm telling you something. You come to him to drink when you feel thirsty. You come to him when you feel like, wait, I don't have that. Now that thirst is coming back. You go back to Jesus. You go back to the one who made you. You go back to the one who died for you. You go back to the one who raised you to life in his resurrection power. And all of a sudden, you're going to start to feel the river flowing. You're going to start to feel that spring bubbling up in that dry land. You're going to start to realize my cup runs over. You're going to start to realize my lot in life is good. My, the lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. And, and there's going to be two things that are going to help you to be more content. Two things. This is going to help you today. The first thing is you're going to remember that social media is all fake. I'm helping you today. If you want to tap into the river wild in your situation, just remind yourself that social media is fake. I'm going to show you this. I, this is going to make me look good. This is, this is the real story. I was, in, I was in Charlotte, North Carolina this week. And I was packing. And at the last minute, our, some friends of ours said, hey, do you want to do a hike while you're here? And I was like, probably North Carolina hike, you know, that I would, as much as I would love to walk around your flat state. Uh, <laughs> but it, for the people and experience, and actually it ended up being a great hike, but I was packing some stuff up for the hike, and then I was also doing a wedding. I felt like James Bond. Here's my suit, and here's my like, hiking outfit in the bag. And, and, and I saw my, my pocket knife, and I was like, I should bring that. Just survival situations, you always, it's good to have a knife on you. And, you know, I, and, and then I was like, nah, how ridiculous is that? It's a North Carolina, like little, like, cute mountain. It'll be wonderful. Um, I, so I didn't bring it. And I remember that moment of like leaving it there. And then we got to the trailhead, and we did the hike. And at the very end, the person we were hiking with was like, hey, I got a cooler full of chilled Topo Chico's in the car for the post hike Topo Chico. And all of us just rejoice. There's nothing like the knowledge of a cold, bubbly drink when you're at the end of a, of a hike in the sun. It was 90 degrees with humidity. So we were all just soaked head to toe at the end of it. But then we were rummaging around in the car. Nobody had a pocket a knife. No one had a bottle opener. She could have sworn she threw one in. I, in, I would never shame Holly Furtick for forgetting the, the <laughs> bottle opener. But there's Topo Chico's all there with ice, but there's no bottle opener. And I was, uh, well, I'm not going to lie to you. I sprang to life. This is, this is what I was born for. I thought of my knife, was sad for a moment, then I remembered how resourceful uh, God has made us to be. And so, so this is what I posted on my social media. You probably saw this, this little clip here of my resourcefulness. Oh, oh, whoa, MacGyver? Did someone call MacGyver? Did someone call MacGyver? Which looked good, and it was an amazing little clip. Uh, but that's not, the whole, that's, not the whole, that's not the whole story. I'm going to show you the longer version that I did not show for my Instagram. Oh, now, hold on. Well, you need to show it again. Only I need to, I need, they got to hear the ending. You got to hear the ending. So l l check out the longer version. Check out the longer version of this video and listen very carefully. We gotta, they got to hear the ending of it. Something I say right at the end. You got to trim that video. You got to trim that video. I instinctively knew the second it happened, you got to trim that video. You got to trim that video down. And I did. I trimmed it down to four seconds from 14, because the four seconds I showed made it look like the first try. Look at this, everybody. Bang, it's open. So here's my point. We're all doing that. We're all trimming that video. 
And because we live our lives jealous watching videos that somebody trimmed, they, they, we, we all are trimming stuff to make it look like it's just this is how it was. It was so easy and effortless. But the reality is every one of us bang our hands into stuff sometimes that doesn't work. We're just not putting that stuff on the internet. And so anytime you're, 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 you're not pleased with the stretch of the river that God has dedicated to you, just remember, A, social media is all curated and fake. And the second thing I want you to remember is this. Seasons change. Seasons change. A river looks so different if you walk up to it in January versus if you walk up to it in July versus if you walk up to it in September. And the seasons and the ebb and flow of life and the different times that we all face, just remember, if you're not happy where you're at, just remember that river's still moving and stuff is still happening. And God is sending clouds upstream to, to lead to a, a deluge that's going to come for you. If you're not happy today, then just keep trusting and keep walking and believe the season that you might leave the river to go find was actually headed to you the whole time. And you're going to be so much more thankful for it if you don't give up. And how many people walked away chasing something that God actually had on the way to them? It was headed there. It was going to get there. And it was going to mean more to you when you didn't short circuit things to get it in your timing. But God instead had it coming for you in his timing. As you listen to the Spirit, you're going to be content. And then thirdly, you're going to be confident. Confident. This is the two words that God just, in a moment, it was just I was sitting there. And these two words, curiosity and confident. The other things flowed in later. But those two words, God said, that's what my spirit wants to do in my bride. I want to curious people. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. I wonder. Let's be childlike, playful, flying some kites with some keys on it a little bit. What discoveries are here in this church to be the, the people of the, I'm not just talking about ministry stuff. I'm talking business ideas and inventions and paintings and songs. And curious. But then confidence. And maybe I'm just preaching this message to me a little bit, but this last year, there's been some hits that I feel like I've, I've experienced and faced that have robbed me of some of my confidence. It's tough to make a decision and automatically know half the country is going to dislike what you're doing. And just, no matter what you do, there's going to be people in the church who think you made the wrong decision. It's tough to make a call. And, and sometimes I make the wrong one. Sometimes I made the right one. But other people don't see it that exact same way. And what it can do over time is take out your confidence. And when you've tried and failed or when you've, when you've had things just end up difficult or hard, eventually it can make you resistant to the idea of putting yourself out there. Maybe some of you have been through, through some relationship difficulties that have made you just feel like, maybe there's no one for me. Or your journey with trying to have a family and have kids. Or you, just can, you, can, you can get a little bit discouraged where you just lose your confidence. And you stop believing that you, you're actually capable of doing something, growing something, building something, trying something. And you start to believe lies like, maybe my best days were behind me. And maybe I just wasn't cut out for this. And maybe this is something that other people can do. And I just got to, maybe this just isn't for me. And then you can just resign yourself to mediocrity, where God has called you to greatness and to impact. I feel the Holy Spirit so strong that he today wants to flow his water through you and out of you. And one of the things that he wants to do is he wants to bring your confidence back. He wants to bring your confidence back, that you're going to step out and try like you've never tried before, that you're going to dust off the failure, you're going to keep going, you're going to keep believing, you're going to keep dreaming. He's trying to bring back your confidence. How does he do that? He does that by reminding you that you are not your productivity or performance or accomplishments. You are, wait for it, his son or daughter. That's going to bring you confidence. And that is what the spirit is all about. Romans chapter 8 says, for you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. That's the confidence trap where your confidence is only tried to what you've done recently and what you've been able to do and the numbers you've been able to pull in at work. When you pull your identity down to that, it's going to make you a slave now. Because even on a good day, you have to top it. And you're going to be a slave to fear. But instead, you received a spirit, the spirit of sonship. And by that spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children, church, God's Holy Spirit. If you listen to what he's saying, he's just saying to you, you are my son. What are we saying to ourselves sometimes? You suck. Is that just me? You suck. You're the worst. You're so stupid. 
You're so fat. I can't believe how dumb you are. Nobody wants you. Nobody wants to be around you. That's what the slavery to fear says. But the spirit, when we listen, the spirit, when we let the river flow, the spirit, when we're spending time with Jesus, is always saying, you're a son. You're a son. You're a son. You're a daughter. You're a daughter. You are loved. The river wild is setting someone free today from the slavery of fear to the peace and serenity that comes through sonship. And when you get along with God, the raging river and the peaceful tranquility is going to remind you, you're just loved. Just get up here and let me love you. Why did Jesus get told by the Father, you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased at the beginning and at the end of his ministry? Because he wanted him to know before he ever lifted a finger to touch a demoniac, before he ever fed anybody, before he ever preached a sermon, that he was just a loved son. And that wasn't going to change. And even the cross couldn't change that. Even the cross couldn't stop that. Even his most difficult, daunting, he was saying, no matter how this goes, no matter what, you, I love you. I'm telling you, when you are armed with the Spirit's voice in your ears, it'll give you your confidence back. You'll try new things because you'll know, even if this doesn't turn out, I'm loved. If it goes well, I'm I'm, lo I'm not loved more. If it goes badly, I'm not loved less. Y'all, I'm getting my confidence back. We're going to walk in confidence. We're going to dream new things. We're going to dare greatly and rise again with the confidence that the Spirit has decided and declared that we're his children. And it's never going to change. We'll become more compassionate, too. The Spirit working in us is going to remind us we're not the only ones struggling with this stuff. Yes. And the Spirit's going to open us up to the revelation that all that water flowing through you is not just for you. It's for everybody who's thirsty around you. You think you're the only one who ever struggled with your worth? You think you've ever, only the one who's ever had debilitating difficulties with depression or darkness? That river's for someone else. That river's for someone else. Why have we always been a church wanting to expand to other cities we must go, to other places we must go? It's not for an ego trip. It's because there are other people thirsty, broken, just like us, and we want to tell them about it. We're going to become more compassionate. And that compassion is going to cause us to rise up in action, because true compassion always leads to righteous action. We will always do something. We're not just going to feel love. We're going to show love. We're going to give love. That's why we are a church that will never be ashamed to talk about money, because the budget is going to have an impact. It's going to feed people, heal people, save people. God uses what we put into his hand. To multiply, in comes the drink, out goes the river. That's like an offering. We, what little offering we give to God, it leads to a river of him touching people. I'm telling you, those, those little mouthfuls of water you get as you give are nothing compared to the river of what's going to be unleashed as you receive the blessing of giving, which is always what a man sows, the same he shall reap except multiplied. You're going to become more compassionate. Because listen, rivers, this is so important. Rivers have upstreams and downstreams. And God not only blessed other people who gave to this ministry and others so that you could be reached, but there's downstreams too. And downstream is the obligation of the reached is to reach. The obligation of the saved is to save. The obligation of the touched is now to touch. If you've received a blessing, it's your opportunity and chance to pay it forward through rising up in compassion. I think about, I wrote down the word dependence. Rivers are full of dependence. If a river dies, the, the flora, the fauna, the fish, everything's impacted by a river going away. So you better keep drinking and receiving and letting him turn into a river, because there's other people looking to you going, will you now save me? Will you now heal me? Will you now send that river on to me? Isaiah 44, verse 3 says, I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your, say it with me, descendants. You can't give up. Your descendants need to be impacted. You can't give up. Your great-grandchildren need to be touched by Jesus. You can't give up. You, I know it's hard right now. You want to throw on the towel right now. But you got to keep find, fighting forward, because someone's got to tell your grandchildren about Jesus. And who's going to do it if you give up today? We need to, to, to populate this world full of people who know Jesus and love him and are sent into the world on mission. And we need to do that fearlessly. And only the Spirit can take away the fear. Now, we've talked about being content, confident, compassionate. We've talked about being curious. And I said there were four things the Spirit's going to do. 
But all these four things have one overarching thing that knits them all together. And that's this. The Spirit's going to make you courageous. The Spirit's going to make you brave. Because you've got to be brave to be content. You've got to be brave to be curious. You've got to be brave to be confident and compassionate. And the Spirit, if he's going to do anything, he's going to make you courageous. And here's the funny thing. As Jesus talked about it, he was talking about two disciples who were going to need that bravery because the Spirit coming for us meant them losing Jesus. Did you catch it in verse 39? The Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. But the day he got glorified, ascending to heaven in a cloud, they lost their own personal Jesus. They lost BFF Jesus they were chilling with for three and a half years. So they had to cheer up, buttercup. It's better. Trust me, it's better. It's better not just for you, but it's better for every single person who's going to be touched by you. It took courage. And the Spirit not only is the solution for our fear, but as he comes into our hearts, the power he gives us is the power of courage to face all the difficult dark things. In fact, that's Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Even as I preach this message, I could feel and sense some of you objecting to the different things. Well, I would be curious, but you don't understand. I would be this, but, but you, don't have, you don't have any idea how many discouraging things I face. And, and, and I, I, it's easy for you to say, be content. And, but what about if, and, and all of those things start to pop up. And what God is saying in every single situation is just come to me and trust me, because I know you don't feel like you have the courage to step out in faith right now. I know you don't feel like you have the courage. But if you come to me living water is going to flow through you. And that living water is going to be full of power. That, it's no mistake that water turns into power. Water, water turns over flywheels. Wa Niagara Fall powers cities in two countries. I'm telling you, where water thunders, the result is always power. You might not. It's finally time for the sermon title. The title of this message is what God wants to give you. He wants to give you liquid courage. He wants to give you liquid courage. He's got liquid courage for you. You see, you see because in our world, when people need a little liquid courage, they might open up a bottle of vodka. I'm, I, I need confidence to talk to that girl. I, I, I need confidence. And so what we think is we think I need confidence. I need a little self-assurance. I need you to pour me up a little liquid courage. But God doesn't want you to turn to, to vodka for courage. He wants living water. He wants living water to flow into you. And that living water is going to turn into power that comes upon you. I'm telling you, the self-assurance, the confidence, the ability to handle debilitating difficulty and darkness, it doesn't come from a bottle. It comes from above. It doesn't come. It doesn't come from whiskey and wine. It comes from a wind, mighty and rushing, triumphant, freely given, offered to you anytime you need it, every time you are asking for it. He wants to pour out water. And that water is going to lead to a wind. A wind. When the Spirit finally showed up, they were ready for power, like, right, earthquakes. And, and they heard it before they saw it. Before any of the early church spit fire, they heard a wind. I was in Dallas two weeks ago, and my computer wasn't working right. The space bar was stuck. Big deal, because I, was, I had allocated the six hours of the flying time to work on the edits for my new book. And I had a real big timetable. And it's a big deal so that I could finish that so I could move on to the next thing. And I get on the plane. I can't do anything. My space bar won't work. And I said, God, I guess you're just trying to give me a gift. So I bought a book in the airport. And I just spent the, the, more, you know, I spent the flight reading a book. And it was a beautiful gift. It was, it was wonderful. And I got to the church. And I was in a meeting. I said, but could someone from the IT department come up? My space bar won't work. I got to get through these edits tonight. And this guy came back, and he got a can of wind. That's what he said. He said, I got a can of wind. It can, it can get rid of what's sticking your space bar key. And he grabbed this can. And all of a sudden, well, it was more mighty and rushing than that. And then he walked out of the room. My space bar was totally fine. That's all it took. I'm like really troubled. I'm like cussing mad on this airplane. And all it took for him was and I just wonder if there's some stuck people today. 
and you don't realize you're looking to this, you're looking to this, you're looking to this, you're looking to this. You think this big elaborate problem, you think you need a whole new computer. And God's solution to stuck things is always to send a wind. It's always his Holy Spirit. It's his liquid courage. It's going to flow into you. It's going to cause the stuck places in your heart to become free. That's why Paul said in Ephesians 5, don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Why would he put a spirit on one side and spirits on the other? Not because there's not liberty to enjoy the gift of a glass of wine if you have that liberty. He's just saying that that's not where your help's going to come from. That's not going to solve any problems in your life. That'll turn down the volume and turn down your ability to care about things temporarily. But tomorrow, the problem's still there. When the Spirit comes flooding into your life, when the Spirit comes upon you, when God's gifts begin to flow through you, when God causes you to be awakened to who your identity is as a blood-bought son or daughter of the King, I'm telling you, when that mighty rushing wind flows in, I'm talking about when you're filled with that kind of liquid courage, now you can walk and look at the problem, the same problem problem that alcohol wants to dim our view of. And now you can look at that problem, and you're not scared of it because you realize you're walking and rolling with the one who's bigger than any problem, any difficulty, any darkness, any danger. You're not scared anymore. What a thing in life. To be eyes wide open, totally aware, completely looking at the same problem you wanted to shut out before but to now speak faith over it and say, this will be the source of a river of life flowing to other people. But here's the key. Here's the key, people, and we're almost done. The key in life is to never, ever, ever confuse a pry off with a twist off, a pry off with a twist off. You see, in the moments when we think we have to have all this force and all this force, but really it's just a, it's just a, it's just a twist off. I think we do the same thing all the time with the Holy Spirit and with walking with Jesus. What did I tell you that the Feast of Tabernacles was commemorating? The water from a rock. Paul says that that rock represents Jesus. 1 Corinthians 10, they all drank from the same spiritual drink. They drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And notice, and that rock was Christ. Jesus was a drinking fountain. First miracle he ever performed in the New Testament, water into drinking fountain. Coming to him to receive what you need. Coming to him to see things change. Coming to him to survive where you can. So, so the rock was Jesus. And what was keeping them alive in the wilderness, though they didn't know it, was Christ. And how did the water flow? Well, we're told in Numbers, Exodus chapter 17, that Moses stood before the people, and he struck the rock. And when Moses struck the, wa the rock, water flowed out of it so the people could drink. Now they got thirsty again later on, and Numbers picks up the story. In the same sort of situation, the people are complaining and afraid. And, and so God tells Moses, do the exact same thing. Numbers 20, verse 8, take the rock and to the rod that you have in your hand. Go in front of the people. But he said, this time it's different. He said, speak to the rock. If you speak to the rock now, it will yield its water. But Moses was sick and tired of these people. They got on his last nerve. And so he got up in front of the, the people and he said, how long will you quit trusting God? How long do I have to deal with you, you rebellious people? And so the Bible says on that day, he grabbed the rod and he smashed the rock. Now it worked and the water came out because God's so good. He'll bless us even when we don't get the blessing of it. He'll bless other people through us, even when we don't get the benefit of it. But it cost Moses something. He wouldn't get to go into the promised land because of his striking a rock that he was supposed to speak to. It wasn't a pry off cap. It was a twist off. Why? Once the rock is struck, it never needs to be struck again. The rock was struck on the cross and blood and water flowed out. So you don't need to strike yourself. So you don't need to beat yourself up. So you don't need to think, I need to pay some penance. I need to do something. I need to keep striking that rock. I, I feel like I've really messed up. I need to do something to honor God now. You never need to strike a rock. It's already been struck. You don't ever have. What do you do now? 
speak to the rock. Speak to the rock. If you speak to the rock, the water will flow. And Christ is that rock. So if you need a spirit, if you're feeling ashamed, if you feel like you're dirty, if you feel like you're, you're traumatized, speak to the rock and the water will flow. Speak to the rock and the river will pour out. Speak to the rock, church. Let's speak to the rock and believe for that Holy Spirit to come upon us.